Enter William F. Buckley. The first new right, succeeding the old right, was centered around the libertarians, traditionalists, and anti-communists at William F. Buckley's National Review, which was closely aligned with the American Jewish League Against Communism, AJLAC. Buckley himself was previously a speechwriter for Senator McCarthy. Quote, the guts of the new conservatism, wrote Murray Rothbard, was the mobilization of big government for the worldwide crusade against communism, unquote. Rothbard was a frequent contributor to the magazine The Freeman, along with AJLAC members Maury Riskind and George Sokolsky. The Libertarian magazine was widely considered to be an important forerunner to Buckley's National Review magazine, which was founded in 1955, and which, from its inception, included many of the same contributing editors. McCarthy's chief support was Alfred Kohlberg, an international merchant trader with business interests in China and Hong Kong, who became a founding member of the China Lobby and the head of the board of directors of the American-China Policy Association, Incorporated. McCarthy's connections to the China lobby came through his close associate, Kohlberg. Kohlberg was a founding director of the original National Council of the John Birch Society in 1958, as well as a member of the American Jewish League Against Communism and was the chairman at the Joint Committee Against Communism. Kohlberg embraced almost any ally, so long as it opposed communism in ways supportive of U.S. business interests. The politicians and leaders he admired most and befriended as well as McCarthy include Chiang Kai-shek, South Korean leader Sing Min Rae, Senators McCarran and Jenner, Richard Nixon, and at the end of his life, Barry M. Goldwater. Riskin himself helped to finance the launch of the magazine. Other links of Buckley's to this network go back to years prior to a dinner event honoring Buckley on the publication of the book God and Man at Yale that was held at the University Club on October 22, 1951. Those in attendance included Merwin K. Hart, Alfred Kohlberg, Joseph P. Camp, and J.B. Matthews. Roy Cohn himself was linked to the National Review via his law partner, Thomas Bolin. Bolin was a Republican powerhouse 
who did legal work for the Trump family. Bolin was a close personal friend of Buckley, whom he helped found the National Review with and served on its board of directors for many years. According to his longtime friend Larry Kudlow, Bolin was, quote, instrumental to the recovery of conservatism from the 50s onward by co-founding the New York Conservative Party and chairing the East Side Conservative Club. They were central points to the revival of conservative thinking and activity, unquote. Both Buckley and Bolin were knights of the sovereign military order of Malta. Buckley's background ties him to the heart of U.S. intelligence. His family has several ties to Yale Skull and Bones Secret Society and the CIA. Buckley was a part of both. Buckley's rarely mentioned father, William F. Buckley Sr., who just happened to be friends with the AJLAC's Merwin K. Hart, was a key figure in the representation of U.S. business interests in Mexico. In 1908, Buckley Sr. moved to Mexico, where, together with his brother Claude, he founded the law firm of Buckley & Buckley to represent major American and European oil companies operating in Mexico. In 1912, he opened an office with his other brother, Edmund, in Tampico. 
1913, Buckley founded and became president of the Pantepec Oil Company, based in Tampico. In 1914, during tensions with the United States, Mexican President Huerta appointed Buckley counsel for a convention organized by Argentina, Brazil, and Colombia. The nations known as the ABC powers were working to mediate relations between Mexico and the U.S. because of their implications for Latin America. Buckley turned his legal practice over to his brothers to speculate in real estate and leasing of oil lands. He then formed the American Association of Mexico, AAM, a lobby group working to amend Article 27 of the 1917 Mexican Constitution to remove recent restrictions on individual American ownership of land and oil rights. In 1921, the Mexican government expelled Buckley because of his AAM activity, and he transferred his Pantepec Oil Company to Venezuela. In Venezuela, Buckley developed a quote-unquote farm-out system. That entailed making agreements with some of the largest oil companies, by which they would share profits on oil found on the land in return for sharing development costs. His first major deal was made with Standard Oil during the 1930s, when a large oil field was discovered on Pantepec's Venezuelan lands. By 1946, Buckley began developing his holdings into separate companies, and his farm out operations became international, expanding major U.S. oil companies' business interests in Canada, Ecuador, Australia, the Philippines, Israel, and Guatemala. At Yale, Buckley Jr. was an active member of the Conservative Party of the Yale Political Union and served as chairman of the Yale Daily News and as an informer for the FBI. Buckley studied political science, history, and economics at Yale, graduating with honors in 1950. Buckley was recruited by E. Howard Hunt to work in Hunt's OPC station in Mexico during the period 1951 through 1952. Buckley and Hunt remained lifelong friends, and Buckley became godfather to Hunt's first three children. It is likely Buckley's father's experience in the region was a key reason why Junior was sought by the agency for this role. The Buckley family's interests and in the Americas and associated groups are something to take into consideration when viewing content publicized by these associated groups. For example, Buckley would go on to become a member of the Mount Pelerin Society and the Council on Foreign Relations. In turn, National Review would act as a media front for the agenda of these groups.
One of the major groups that emerged around the same time as the National Review was the American Security Council. The year prior to the founding of the ASC, the democratically elected Guatemalan government of Colonel Jacobo Arbenz Guzman was toppled by U.S.-backed forces led by Colonel Carlos Castillo Armas. This military operation was armed, trained, and organized by the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency. In the 1930s, under Samuel Zamuri, United Fruit received import duty and real estate tax exemptions from the Guatemalan government, as well as being given hundreds of square miles of land. United Fruit controlled more land than any other individual or group. It also owned the railway, the electric utilities, telegraph, and the country's only port. United Fruit Company which hold a monopoly of the fruit industry within Guatemala, owning 42% of Guatemala's land. Due to holding the monopoly, they were able to pay extremely low wages, implementing effectively no workers' rights, and were then given tax breaks due to their influence, reaping all the rewards of Guatemala's fruit industry, with the Guatemalan people being exploited for their labour, effectively a neo-feudal system. This unsurprisingly created a huge demand for change and animosity towards the US influence in Guatemala. After revolution in 1944, the first elective leader, Avarello, who won by a landslide, began implementing social reforms in Guatemala, enforcing equal rights and a minimum wage, attempting to take Guatemala away from this exploitative economy. Later, in 1951, Jacobo Arbenz was elected and oversaw a shift further left for Guatemala. He went ahead with land reforms in 1952, which saw the land owned by United Fruit Company, which was only 15% cultivated, redistributed to the citizens who worked on them. The directors of United Fruit Company were immensely upset by Arbenz's changes and used their lobbyists in Washington to manipulate the Truman and Eisenhower administrations to back a coup to get Colonel Arbenz out of power. Despite having no evidence, they claimed Arbenz intended to align Guatemala with the Soviet bloc. Unfortunately for Arbenz, members of the Eisenhower administration and intelligence agencies had deep ties to United Fruit. United States Secretary of State John Foster Dulles was a member of the law firm Sullivan and Cromwell, which had represented United Fruit. His brother, Alan Dulles, director of the CIA, was also a board member of United Fruit. United Fruit Company is the only company known to have a CIA cryptonym. The brother of the Assistant Secretary of State for Inter-American Affairs, John Morris Cabot, had once been president of United Fruit. Ed Whitman, who was United Fruit's principal lobbyist, was married to President Eisenhower's personal secretary, Ann C. Whitman. Many individuals who directly influenced U.S. policy towards Guatemala in the 1950s also had direct ties to United Fruit.
From the U.S. corporate interest point of view, the coup was initially an incredible success. The success, however, marked the beginning of a dark chapter of American support for similarly styled military coups and dictatorships in Central America. The United States of America, a supposed advocate for democracy, then implemented a military dictatorship which would lead to years of violence and civil war engulfing Guatemala. The US-backed regime was brutal, with an estimated 200,000 civilians murdered for disagreeing with the far-right dictatorship, to which they had actively fought against and previously overthrown. After reverting back to a far-right dictatorship, corruption was thriving and the economy crumbling, with the US having to fund a government with millions of dollars, which was committing massacres, genocidal rape and aerial bombings. This is one of the darkest chapters in America's history, However, sadly, it is common within their involvement in Latin America during the 20th century. There is something horrifically sinister, as a supposed greatest country in the world acts this way, hiding their actions from the citizens, murdering hundreds of thousands and funding the deaths of millions. In the United States, the man who approved the propaganda campaign carried out against Arbenz by Edward Bernays was United Fruit President Samuel Zamuri. Shortly after this approval, Zamuri resigned as president. United Fruit Company and their intertwined network with the U.S. establishment, however, would continue their lobbying through another arm, the newly founded American Security Council. The ASC was founded by retired General Robert E. Wood. As a military general, Wood was the director of the Panama Railroad Company. He served in the Panama Canal Zone for 10 years during the construction of the canal. After Wood retired in July 1915 by special act of Congress as a major, he went on to be an asset of the private sector. He worked as assistant to the vice president of DuPont and headed operations in the United States, Venezuela, and Trinidad for the General Asphalt Company. After returning to the Army, serving in World War I, Wood went back to the private sector. In 1924, he became vice president of Sears Roebuck. At this point, Wood started to become a leader in the old right American conservatism movement and would be for the rest of his long career. Wood served as the America First Committee's first president on an interim basis. The America First Committee lobbied for the same strategy that the business interests benefited greatly from that was adopted by Woodrow Wilson, opposing U.S. direct involvement in the First World War while war orders from allies built up. America First Committee lobbied for a repeat of the same situation for the Second World War. Wood acted as a patriotic front for U.S. business interests. His employer, Sears Roebuck, became a financial donor to the ASC. The company was founded by Julius Rosenwald and presided over by the Rosenwald family. The Zamuris and Rosenwalds were family friends and amongst the wealthiest in New Orleans. The two families were big financial donors to their local temple, 
Temple Sinai, and Rabbi Julian B. Feibelman, who was a member of B'nai B'rith. Both families were supporters of the Zionist movement. The granddaughter of Julius, Nina Rosenwald, would go on to become one of the biggest American supporters of the Zionist and neoconservative movements, as well as the Team B network of fear-mongering national security hawks. Nina's first financial political support was for Democratic Senator Henry Scoop Jackson, a product of the Albert Wolstetter Rand Corporation Chicago School Nexus that would develop what we know of today as the neoconservatives. Jackson was a founding member of the ASC. Other members were Walt Disney, Nelson Rockefeller, W. Averill Harriman, Edward Teller, John Singlob, Ray Klein, Eugene V. Rostow, Senator John G. Tower, Governor Leroy Collins, Senator Thomas J. Dodd, and Lyman Lemnitzer, Operation Northwood's author. The ASC's important funders included General Dynamics, General Electric, Lockheed, Boeing, Motorola, and McDonnell Douglas, making ASC a convergence of politicians, intelligence agents, retired military personnel, defense contractors, corporate representatives, bankers, and even a Hollywood studio head. In essence, the military-industrial complex. The ASC campaigned against strategic arms limitation talks and other arms control agreements and argued aggressively for ever-increasing Pentagon budgets to pay for weapon systems such as the B-1 Lancer bomber, the MX missile, and Strategic Defense Initiative. Between 1983 and 1985, ASC ran 13 full-page ads in the New York Times and the Washington Post advocating the MX missile system. Wes McTune of the Washington, D.C.-based Group Research, which monitors the political right, described the ASC as, quote, not just the representative of the military-industrial complex, it is the personification of the military-industrial complex, unquote. The network of the ASC-affiliated organizations defended American corporatism by continuing using the notion of a globalist communist conspiracy to denounce any opposition and smear them as quote-unquote communist. By purportedly opposing the quote-unquote globalist agenda, of the likes of the Rockefeller-dominated Council on Foreign Relations, despite their own connections to family members, they attempted to disguise themselves in anti-establishment and populist rhetoric in order to advance their corporate fascistic agenda. The ASC set out to continue the military-industrial complex's rhetoric that communism in the Soviet Union were the greatest evils in the world, and that the Soviets were determined to achieve military superiority and world domination. Those within the U.S. who advocated disarmament and lower defense spending are considered by the ASC to be victims of communist disinformation. According to the ASC, a counter-strategy was required that involved a huge military buildup, an internal strategic and civil defense network, an increase in security and intelligence capabilities, and strong opposition to all arms control agreements. Economically, the strategy would require a strong U.S. economy and policies that, quote, 
will protect our overseas sources of energy and other vital raw materials, unquote. Outside of the U.S., it called for use of non-military means to counter the influence of communism and support of American allies and other non-communist governments against communist aggression, a continuation and expansion of the Marshall Plan. The ASC co-sponsored a series of annual meetings from 1955 to 1961, which inspired President Eisenhower's famous exit speech. We can no longer risk emergency improvisation of national defense. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. How to do this? Three and a half million men and women are directly engaged in the defense establishment. We annually spend on military security alone more than the net income of all United States corporations. Now, this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals, so that security and liberty may prosper together. Akin to and largely responsible for the sweeping changes in our industrial military posture has been the technological revolution during recent decades. In this revolution, research has become central. It also becomes more formalized, complex, and costly. A steadily increasing share is conducted for, by, or at the direction of the federal government. Today, the solitary inventor, tinkering in his shop, has been overshadowed by task forces of scientists in laboratories and testing fields. In the same fashion, the free university, historically the fountainhead of free ideas and scientific discovery, has experienced a revolution in the conduct of research Partly because of the huge costs involved, a government contract becomes virtually a substitute for intellectual curiosity. For every old blackboard, there are now hundreds of new electronic computers. The prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by federal employment, project allocations, and the power of money is ever-present and is gravely to be regarded. Yet in holding scientific research and discovery in respect, as we should, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific technological elite. It is the task of statesmanship to mold, to balance, and to integrate these and other forces, new and old, within the principles of our democratic system ever aiming toward the supreme goals of our free society. And called National Military Industrial Conferences, which included the National Association of Manufacturers, NAM, Chambers of Commerce, and several university institutes. Elements of the Pentagon, National Security Council, and organizations linked to the CIA discuss Cold War strategy with industry leaders such as United Fruit, Standard Oil, 
Honeywell, U.S. Steel, and Sears Roebuck. In 1978, the American Security Council organized the Coalition for Peace Through Strength, CPTS, with the doctrine Reagan would adopt in a successful presidential campaign. Despite the official ring to its name, the American Security Council is not the other league to the National Security Council, nor does it have any formal government status. It is a pressure and propaganda group funded by blue chip corporations, which promotes a tough military stance based on hardline anti communism. In its field, the ASC may be just as influential in shaping U.S. policy as the National Security Council. After the seesaw legislative battle of 1969 over the Safeguard ABM system, President Nixon acknowledged in writing that, quote, the American Security Council played a major role in achieving that victory, unquote. Since the margin of victory for the pro-ABM forces was one vote, it is conceivable that the ASC played a decisive role. In any event, the ASC is one of the most, one of the most powerful mainsprings of the right. I first became aware of the ASC in 1962, Turner writes, when I noticed some of its literature on the desk of another former FBI agent who was a security officer at the University of California's Lawrence Radiation, Radiation Laboratory. It turned out that the ASC is a kind of FBI offshoot. It was founded in 1955 by former G-men, and the initial service it offered member firms was a dossier system modeled after the FBI's, which was intended to weed out employees and prospective employees deemed disloyal to the free enterprise concept. The Joseph McCarthy virulence and the Cold War were both at their peak when the ASC began as the Mid-American Research Library. The impetus was provided by the late General Robert E. Wood, then board chairman of Sears Roebuck and Company. Along with the cantankerous Colonel Robert R. McCormick of the Chicago Tribune, the world's greatest newspaper, the colonel used to trumpet, and its radio station call letters are still WGN, Wood, this is Robert E. Wood, chairman of Sears, Wood had been a prime mover in the isolationist America First Committee and a prime adversary of the trade union movement. With the growing preoccupation of industry with, quote, security, the establishment of a private body that would provide corporations with a blacklist service and loyalty review board was almost inevitable. Expanding rapidly, the Mid-American Research Library was renamed the American Security Council in 1956 when former FBI agent John M. Fisher, who had come to Sears as a, quote, personnel consultant with J. Edgar Hoover's blessing in 1953, was installed as president and executive director. Before long, Fisher had surrounded himself with bureau-trained men. Jack E. Eisen, ISON, was appointed operating director and William K. Lambie, Jr., research director. Both had been put in a few, both had put in a few years with the FBI. Both are still in those positions. W. Cleon Skousen, S-K-O-U-S-E-N, who was named field director, had been an agent from 1940 to 1951 and is well known in right-wing circles as the author of The Naked Communist and The Communist Attack on U.S. Police. Skousen left the American Security Council in 1960 to become a John Birch functionary and is a perennial figure on the society's lecture circuit. In time, retired FBI assistant director Stanley J. Tracy was brought in to sit on the strategy staff. Among the non-staff officers with a history under J. Edgar Hoover are Senior Vice President Kenneth M. Piper, quote, Director of Human Relations for Motorola, Vice President Stephen L. Donchus, a U.S. Steel executive, and Vice President Russell E. White, a General Electric Security consultant. For the first few years, the ASC devoted itself to amassing the dossier system housed in the, quote, Research and Information Center in the executive offices at 123 North Wacker Drive in Chicago. In 1958, it purchased a collection of one million names from the estate of Harry Jung, spelled like the psychologist, J-U-N-G, publisher of American Vigilante, and described by the Chicago Sun-Times at the time as, quote, one of Chicago's most notorious purveyors of anti-Semitic propaganda during the late 1930s, and an old-time labor foe. 
The system is constantly being enlarged through contributions from the security departments of member firms, from the transcripts of hearings staged by state and federal, quote, anti-subversive committees, and from the cullings of a full-time staff reviewing thousands of publications for data on, quote, left-wingers.